Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pets Plus Live Beyond the Pages. These are recorded live, so I like to chat with our audience a little bit in the beginning just to make sure that our live audience can hear me. So I promise, though, if you stick around through the whole thing, that you will be inspired and you will definitely learn some new tricks, too. So if you're just joining in, I apologize for the delay, uh, but if you're just joining in live, please comment by letting me know in the comment thread if you've been to Manhattan or not. I wanna know if you can hear me too, but I wanna know if you've been to Manhattan or not. I also would really love to know if you have been to a Broadway play and what your favorite Broadway play is. You know, I, I wanna get to know you better too, and I know that our People that are watching tonight would love to hear what you have to say about that. You know, my favorite Broadway show is Chicago. Actually, it was the very first show that I saw on Broadway, and it was because my dad took me. I was doing job interviews um, right out of college, and I got to see Chicago, which is kind of funny because uh, my my stores, my pep stores, were in Chicago, and my first business coach I ever hired was also the director's assistant on Chicago before she was a business coach. Uh, so I, I think Broadway is so amazing and New York City is amazing. And the reason I bring it up is that tonight we are chatting with a Manhattan business owner. And so I just thought that could be a little bit fun to get us kicked off and get started. All right. Well, welcome to Pets Plus Live Beyond the Pages. I'm your show host, Candace Daniolo. And in each episode, you get to go on a journey with me. Beyond the printed pages of the magazine, I've got the magazine behind me and I have it right here. We get to go beyond the pages, connecting you straight with the experts and contributors and providing you an opportunity to dig deeper into their brilliant content and allowing you also the opportunity to chat directly with us. So don't be shy. During the entire show, feel free to type comments or ask questions at any time, even if you're watching this after the live airing, because I'll definitely jump back in and answer those questions later. So if you are joining us live, though, we do have a Q&A time at the very end um, to answer any of your questions, and you can put those in at any point. Helping pet professionals like you, build amazing businesses is a true passion of mine, and it's why Pets Plus and I team up together so much. We both believe in helping you lead a successful life in business and personally, and I help people do that in business as a pet business consultant at Pet Boss Nation by helping lots of pet businesses, especially retailers, with inventory planning, cash flow roadmaps, marketing strategies, promotions, and HR help. <laughs> I do that through one-on-one -on -one consulting or our monthly group co uh, coaching program, the Pet Boss Club. Now, Pets Plus is the industry's newest publication and it is an essential business building resource for pet stores, pet boutiques, kennels, groomers, cat sitters, dog walkers, and pretty much any pet business that deals directly with consumers. So make sure you follow Pets Plus uh, to get the latest trends, news, products, as well as actionable advice to grow your business. And before we get in, I just want to mention it because it is in the January issue that Pets Plus does this really cool thing every year called America's Coolest Stores. And they have just announced that uh, they're taking um, applications to potentially win. And if you win, not only do you get bragging rights that you won, but you get featured in the magazine and you get to be on these webinars with me. And our guest tonight, Tanya from Camp Canine, she is one of the coolest stores. So you can apply today at petsplusmag.com forward slash ACS. Okay. Awesome. So I can tell that you guys are with us. Um, for this episode of Pets Plus Live Beyond the Pages, we are talking about what it's like to be have a, to take a struggling business. I mean, this business, when Tanya bought it, was really, really struggling. She took that business and she turned it into making a 300% increase in her revenue. And she invested a lot in her people. And so we're going to uncover how when you invest in your team, that you truly increase your profits. 
So tonight we're going to be speaking with Tanya Eisenstein, as I've said, the amazing super boss who leads a mega team of 45 people at one location where they offer the most exclusive doggy daycare, boarding, grooming services on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And her pet business owes its success to training its humans and not the dogs. I love that. I was just at a pet, uh, con or I was just at a conference with a bunch of dog trainers, and I love they were like, yeah, we help the humans lead the leash and not the dog train the dogs. It's so important. Well, after a long, passionless career in law, Tanya found her love in caring for dogs, and that passion infects her entire organization. She's also just as passionate about mentoring and making sure that her high expectations are met. So before I bring Tanya on, I want to give you a glimpse into what it's like to be this top dog in the Big Apple. It's like boarding and grooming, but as Tyler Matheson tells us, it was more out of a love for dogs than money that one former lawyer got the bright idea to buy a doggy daycare center that was getting a little rough around the edges. Who's happy to go to work? You are. Boy. It's not unusual to find a dog at the office these days, but Tanya Eisenstein's story is hardly the norm. A lifelong dog lover and career lawyer, Eisenstein gave up a high-paying job at Goldman Sachs well into six figures to buy Camp Canine, a doggy daycare center back in 2012. Sounds crazy, right? All my friends looked at me and said that. My parents looked at me and said that. Everybody I knew thought I was pretty nuts for doing this. Before Eisenstein bought it, the business had become, well, dog-eared. It was in a steep decline. I'll admit, I didn't read the Yelp reviews of this place before I took it over. And when I read them afterwards, I was horrified. To fix it, she aimed to offer the best possible customer service. But training and retaining the kind of employees who can learn things like how to recognize when a dog needs help, well, it's no easy task. Hi. So as per usual, she played the one thing Eisenstein changed is the starting pay, now a couple of bucks above the minimum wage. This is not a minimum wage job. You're, you're caring for, for living beings, right? If you care about your employees, I find that they care back and they will care more about your business as well. Eisenstein says it's a small price to pay for the kind of love her staff gives, from food prep to high-end grooming, even one-on-one -on -one walks in Central Park, sometimes ending with a hot dog snack. And the business has turned around, going from about 40 dogs a day to 100. The staff has grown from 8 to 35, and revenues have doubled in three years to well over a million dollars a year. The dogs get room to run inside a generous for Manhattan 5,000 square foot rental space. She's put about a quarter of a million dollars into renovations since she took over. The floor alone is approximately $75,000. Companies like Camp Bow Wow and Dogtopia have built multi-million dollar businesses with hundreds of franchises. But Eisenstein says that's not for her. Franchising to me, it takes the love out of it. You know, I spent a long time in a career that I did not love, and this means a lot to me, and I don't want to sell it out. Being on Manhattan's affluent, dog-rich Upper West Side hasn't hurt either. Eisenstein counts entertainer Bernadette Peters among her all-star clientele. There was even a guest spot on TV doing makeovers for rescue dogs, a pet project of sorts. One of Eisenstein's dogs, Nacho, is a rescue. So far, about 75 rescue animals have made a foster home stop at Camp Canine before being adopted. This is Roper. He's available for adoption now. It's a passion play, paying off in more ways than one. When you take a foster, you free up a spot in a shelter, and so you're, you're saving dogs' lives. And people come back here with those dogs. So, you know, I just tried to do a good thing. It actually turned out to be good for business. And Camp Canine recently added cat care to it. Okay. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you. Yes, yes. so there she is in the flesh. She, we saw her on national TV. She's like a mega celebrity, I'm sure, in Manhattan. <laughs> and now she's joining us. Well, all right, so I want to know, I'm sure that our viewers who just watched that amazing video, of you, 
um, have questions now after seeing all of all of the little snippets in your daycare. So if you if you have any questions, just type them because at the end we're gonna have a live Q and A. Tanya, I really would love to start at the beginning. You know, you worked on Wall Street and you opened a doggy daycare. So tell us what that transition was like and what got you motivated to buy a pet care business. <laughs> well, um, the transition was definitely. Um, Challenging. Um, I, I uh, thought I knew what I was getting into, but no, I really didn't. Um, but my, my thought process was simply one of, over time, not being able to get myself excited about coming into work in the morning. Um, there were, for, for the first maybe 15 years or so, it was exciting enough just to know I was in that industry and environment and doing a good job and that was enough. But in time, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm the kind of person that just can't do that. I have to do what I love. So um, it took me a while, it took me you know, a good 20 years total to figure out what I really love. And what it is, is it's dogs. Um, so I knew, I narrowed it down to something with dogs. Okay. Um, however, I'm not at all um, technically inclined. So, you know, biology, veterinary stuff, not, I can't do blood or anything like that or anything sad either. So um, I narrowed it down to a doggy daycare or with boarding, et cetera. And um, I did not want to start one from scratch, knowing that I really honestly didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I embarked on looking for uh, doggy daycares for sale in Manhattan. Okay. Yeah, so were you scared? I mean, I don't know. I feel like entrepreneurship sometimes can be a little nerve wracking. And here you're buying an existing or a business that's got a team and rent. I'm sure rent is really high in Manhattan. Were you scared to make the jump? You know, if I thought about it, I would have been, but I specifically really didn't think it, think about it. I just made the decision and went, um, and, and that was it. If I had stopped to think about it, I'm honestly not sure I would have done it. Yeah. Well, and it's, that's so true because it's like you took some action. You knew, you knew that you wanted to change. Your, your feeling of staying where you were was probably so, or not wanting to stay where you were was so strong that it propelled you to make a change. Jump. That's correct. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So if you would go, if you could go back to when you acquired this business, would you have done anything differently? Yes. Okay. I would have done a lot more due diligence on the business. Um, uh, for example, um, a lot of people on this call are, are fellow business owners. Everyone knows the importance of Yelp reviews. Mm -hmm. And it, on a, I, embarrassingly, it didn't occur to me to look at that, as I mentioned in the, in the clip you showed. Um, and had I done that, I would have realized that I actually needed to change the name. Yelp won't get rid of the old reviews unless you change the name. And as a result, my Yelp reviews ratings are still low because the previous owners did some horrible things like actually losing a dog. Oh, so yeah. um, I still have those reviews and Yelp won't remove them. So. You know, I'm almost six years in now. I, I'm not going to change the name now, but I wish I had. Yeah. Yeah, that is an interesting um, aspect. And for people who have either thought to sell their business, it's one thing. You know, there's a lot of I, I've sold a, I've sold a business in the pet space. And when I meet people now and they're like, how did you sell your business? I'm like, well, actually, I started putting a lot of strategy in place about three years before I sold my business because I wanted to make you know the most money that I could from it. And so things like that were really important um, uh, just in case, you know, business owners did look at those um, kind of different facts about your business. So when you um, when you went to go look for the business to, to purchase, how did you find this particular business? I went through a broker. You know, I never knew in my previous career that there are there's a whole industry out there of small businesses mm -hmm. and brokers who, you know, sell them. So. It was an amazing discovery to me. So I, uh, I registered with a few of them and pretty quickly two came up in Manhattan that I was interested in. The first one was uh, downtown and I live uptown. Uh, so it's doable, but it, it wasn't as perfect as the second one. And the second one that came up was Camp Canine. Um, not only had I been a client of Camp Canine about eight or nine years prior, but it is literally on the street I live on. So oh, wow. I, I live on West 73rd Street and camp is also on West 73rd Street. I took that as a sign. So yeah. 
I would yeah. say so. I, I have spent some time living above my doggy daycare. I'll tell you, there's nothing like not having a commute. I just love it. <laughs> yes, I have a two block commute. So there is some variable, you know, with that, but not much. Yeah, not much. So when you started, did you, did you jump in full time or were you part time transitioning out of your business into this one? What'd that look like? No, I did not jump in part time and I would not suggest that anybody do that. It was beyond full time immediately. Okay. Um, I did end up taking a little time off between jobs, um, just finalizing the sale. Um, but as soon as the sale was finalized, it was beyond a full time job. I honestly, I don't think you can just start or take over a business like this on a part time basis and be successful. Very true. Very true. So as a new owner coming in, uh, working full time, did you get some pushback from the team that was there? And how that long did it, did it take to earn like their respect or buy in to have a new owner? Yeah, pushback would be an understatement. <laughs> um, the, the, the previous ownership, um, you know, did not have uh, the practices even close to what I would consider to be adequate in place. Another thing I wish I had looked at a little more carefully before I bought, nonetheless. So I had instituted a lot of controls, policies, procedures, up the level of service, a whole, I mean, a whole litany of things. Mm -hmm. And yes, there was tremendous pushback uh, from the staff. At this point, I have, I think, two employees still from that original staff. I ended up over the years having to basically turn the whole staff over. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not easy because here they know, they know they've been in the industry longer than you have. <laughs> and that's they right. know the customers. And that's a scary place to be because you're relying on them. But I'm so glad that you did that because I, I know I see it time and time again now with even with my clients that they're, they're keeping team on too long and it's really damaging their business and their potential success. So I'm glad to hear that you had to make those while they're very difficult decisions and it's never easy to term anyone. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's necessary. Yes. So what have you found as being the most challenging part of now becoming an entrepreneur? You know, we were just talking about staff. It, it's, it's staffing. Um, that, you know, it, it sounds fairly mundane um, and, it, and it shouldn't be as hard as it is, but it is. Um, it's hard to find people um, that you can get to be committed to your business, that um, are reliable and, um, you know, just good employees. It's really hard to find good employees. Once we find them, we do, we do a very good job at keeping them. But luckily, my business is growing, so we need more and more employees. So we, we do need to keep on hiring. Um, but that, to me, is the most challenging part of it. Where have you found is the best place to secure employees? I know that that's been kind of a that's always a hot topic of conversation in the pet space. Yeah. Um, I use Indeed. Um, I like What I like about Indeed is that they have a workflow process. So part of the way we recruit is we set up some, um, some sort of hurdles for people to jump through before they can have an interview with us. Mm -hmm. so for example, yeah, so for example, I'll get a resume on Indeed. Um, I then, ha if I like the resume, I have a set of standard questions mm -hmm. that I send to candidates and I give them 48 hours to reply. And I tell them that. If they yeah. don't reply within 48 hours, they're, they're out. Um, if I don't like their answers, they're out. If I do like their answers, Indeed has a, a sort of automated pre-screening uh, voicemail thing so they can ask some, you can ask some general questions and just get the responses recorded. So you can hear the person's voice and hear how they sound and see if you like what they say. You also, again, weed out some more people who never end up replying to that. So mm -hmm. once they go through those, if they pass all of that, then they get to come in for an interview. And that really cuts down on my wasted time. Yeah, I think that's brilliant because it gives them a deadline. You can, tell, you can find out if they can meet deadlines, follow instructions and have the level of professionalism that you need. That's so smart, Tanya. <laughs> well, that took a few years to get that, but um, the other great source of employees is referrals from current employees. Okay, do you find that in that though, that there are, I mean, I would hope an, an employee, at this, at this level, your employees are probably very well trained that they wouldn't want uh, a kind of a bad apple in the mix anyway. But have you ever found that by pushing that, that they're just recommending their friends and then it gets awkward at work and it's harder to be the boss for them? I could, I could see that some people might feel that way. So, um, yes. 
what I do when I tell the staff I'm looking for, for people, um, and if they, you know, asking for referrals, I be sure to tell them very clearly, make sure this is someone you want to work with and somebody that you know that I'm going to respect and will be a good employee because it's going to reflect really on you if they're not. Yeah. So I'm very clear about that. And then when they do come in, I'm also very clear that if any issues arise, I do let my employees know, hey, you know, your referral, I don't know, call him Joe, um, has a real lateness problem. If he keeps doing it, you know I'm going to fire him, right? Um, and a couple times that did happen. But for the most part, we've gotten some great employees from referrals. So after hearing you even explain that and after reading your article, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, it's a big, beautiful spread, uh, the interview that Pamela Mitchell did uh, with Tanya. Um, it sounds like you're a very hands-on owner and you can tell from the videos that you know, you're in there. How do you, um, as being so involved, um, say or not micromanage? You know, micro and, you know, micromanaging is not a great thing. So how do you, as a hands-on owner, prevent that from happening? Well, that's a daily struggle and my staff will attest to it. Um, so um, again, literally every day this is a struggle. One of the things I did that really helped was moving my office a little further away. Um, at one point it had been downstairs where most of that video was shot. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully we were able to get some more space sort of upstairs so it's a little bit further away. And I've actually just rented some different space that's non-contiguous that I'm going to move to within the next month okay. in hope of removing, physically removing myself a little bit. Yeah, I, I have a strategy in my office, too, where I would put up a um, laminated sign that said, do not disturb, <laughs> just so I wasn't in On well, my door. I can show you. If you would you yeah. like me to show you? Yeah. I have a great do not disturb sign that my staff made for me. Okay. Here we are. They all realize this needs to happen, and when this is up, nobody can come in. Yeah, top dog at work. Do not disturb. <laughs> yes. They made this for my sanity, and probably theirs, too. Yes, so smart. <laughs> um, so you've shared in that article, too, that, you know, you've investing in human resources is what increased your revenue by 300% since 2012. So congratulations first on your success. I am so happy for you and impressed by that. Congratulations. It's not easy to do. Thank you. From my experience as a business owner as well and as a consultant, you know, working with pet business owners, uh, leading, being a good leader, training employees, and resolving conflict a lot between either them or even when you have to discuss um, difficult issues with them is one of the greatest challenges of growth, but it's necessary to grow a business. You need support and you need team. So at what point did you realize that you needed to make HR the number one priority? Um, and is there one story that was like that one defining moment? I'm not sure I have that. Um, you know, I, I have a background in human resources from my previous career. So okay. honestly, day one, I came in with that as a priority knowing that um, each employee was going to be the, the ambassador for Camp Canine and dealing with clients. And every single person had to feel proud and committed and exude customer service. Um, so day one, I, don't, I don't, didn't have an aha moment. Just I knew that was super important. You knew it was important. Why, from your previous experience, why, why is it so important? I mean, you said sure. they were ambassadors, but there are people who are going to be watching this who – either don't make it a priority or are afraid to make it a priority. So what's your point of view on team? Sure. Um, committed and happy employees work harder. They do better. They think, you know, they can, you are better able to step back and do up strategic things and rely on them to carry on your brand. Um, people who aren't happy and they leave, first of all, you don't, turnover is never a good thing from a cost and, you know, knowing customers and knowing the uh, the dog's perspective. But happy employees, satisfied employees, just, they just work harder and they work better. Definitely. So you've also mentioned that you have high expectations. Yeah. <laughs> you demand that. So yeah. how do you motivate employees to meet those high expectations? So the first is that... Um, I have to live it and I have to hold myself and I do to, to very high expectations. Um, you know, I just, I make it very clear when I hire people, um, that this is the case. 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if any of my, my team is on this call and typing questions or comments about this. I would love to hear from them. How, if how, if any team is watching, definitely let us know. Yeah, how they think I, I help um, people to do that. Um, but what I think I do is I equip them. Um, so, you know, I set an expectation. If it's not met, I'll explore with the employee, why is that not being met? Why are you not doing that? Do you need training? Do you need some support from me? Do you need a different schedule? What do you need in order to do this? Because this is what I need you to do. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of solve it together. Mm -hmm. And that general approach and empowering people. Um, and again, it's being very, very honest with people. You know, um, it works. And it's helped change our culture here into a real attitude of, well, of course we expect that. We are the best. It took a few years to get to, but people are really proud of it. And then when they, you know, they see our great reviews or see things like this, people are proud to be associated and, you know, set even higher expectations for themselves. So how do you um, reward their good behavior or their hard work or potentially even innovation? innovation? Sure. And that's also, that's a constant. Um, all of us need constant positive reinforcement. Or, you know, if you don't deserve it, there needs to be negative. But that's not the question. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, so from, you know, on a day to day basis, it's giving immediate feedback to people, whether it's good or bad, but specifically good feedback. We have a, a gift card program when I or any member of management sees an employee just doing something that exemplifies what we want. They get a ten dollar gift card of their choice, whether it's to, to Shake Shack or Amazon or Chipotle. Um, that's just on the spot rewards um, on a more you know, sort of lasting basis. Um, once you're here for a year, you're eligible for a bonus, a profit sharing bonus. So the bonus pool uh, depends upon, of course, our profitability. But your slice of that bonus pie depends on your performance. So if you have great performance over the year, you will get a very significant bonus at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. um, throughout as well, we have a very um, uh, established review process. Employees get a sit down review every year. New employees get one after 90 days. Um, so those are those are are some of the things um, that we do to reward our folks. Oh, and we just announced just this isn't really tied to performance, but just tied to overall morale. Um, on Valentine's Day, um, we're going to have a masseuse in here um, giving out employees um, massages throughout the day for Valentine's Day. Oh, but they'll love that. <laughs> yes, I'll be signed up for that as well. Honey, are you hiring? I could move to New York. <laughs> Thankfully, we are not right now, but you never know. Put in your application. We'll, we'll let you know. Okay, I do have some doggy daycare experience. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, so I love that you brought up reviews. Um, do you find uh, that by just doing it just yearly, that it leaves too long for someone to get some feedback? No, because we have a culture of feedback. You know, one of the things that we do every week in our in our management meetings is we review the staff. We our first question is who's doing great this week? Who's been doing fabulously? We talk about whoever that is. Um, we make sure that some member or all members of management get to that employee and say, "You've been doing, you know, you've been doing a really good job. Thank you." Um, so every week we have that discussion. We also do the flip side of that, and those people will get, you know, some feedback as well if if uh, things aren't going well. So it is. You know, literally every week we talk about this and we get back to employees weekly with, with feedback. Mm -hmm. So what other kind of meetings do you have? I love that your, your management uh, has a weekly meeting. What other meetings do you find critical and important in your company? Sure. Um, so there's the, the leadership meeting, management meeting, which is weekly. Um, we have monthly full staff meetings. And at those meetings, you know, we do administrative things like, you know, um, talking about why you know, fluffy ate a tennis ball or, you know, whatever the case may be, but up to, you know, training people on um, doggy body language. So we always have a training element. We have some administrative elements and some team building elements once a month. In addition, I meet weekly with the salespeople. You know, sales is, is tremendously important. So I directly manage that. And the salespeople and I meet every week to talk about, you know, a variety of things. So that's mm -hmm. a weekly meeting as well. And I also meet every week with our uh, marketing person who also does our social media. Mm -hmm. I think those yeah, are the regular meetings. Those are definitely critical ones that as the owner, as you start to grow your company and step away, um, have definitely the people who answer your phones and respond to emails should 
know your vision, know your voice, because as you grow and add on team, you sometimes um, checking in and making sure that it's up to the standards that they expect. So yes. that's, really, that's really good that you're doing that too. And with these meetings, I'm curious, because I get this question a lot, you know, are people allowed to bring food? Uh, do you do drinks? Do you pay people? Is attendance required? How do you incorporate that into a successful culture? Sure. Attendance is required. We schedule it during normal working hours and we use, we need to have two meetings um, because you always need somebody minding the store downstairs. So we always have to make sure our playrooms are staffed and yeah, people are required to come and they get paid. We usually buy the food for the meetings. You know, we like to have fun foods. You know, we, we mix up what kind of foods we get. You're um, in a great city for having, <laughs> having lots of good true. options. That is true. Um, so yeah, so that during our last staff meeting we had, uh, I don't know if you guys have baked by Melissa elsewhere or not, the little teeny mini cupcakes. We had those at our last staff meeting. Oh, that's, that's good. What? A little, a little touch of something special. It doesn't have to be a big full on meal. I like that. Correct. One. Yeah. Everyone's happy. So, you know, if we get like bags of Doritos, you know, that we do that too. You know, they, they definitely the, the weight of my, my team's, uh, heart is through their stomach for sure. They love it when clients send, send gifts and treats. And that is something I, I haven't been a former retailer. You know, I feel like retail stores don't get the gifts from clients like a pet care mm -hmm. provider gets. Oh, and yeah. Christmas time, it's just uh, 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 like out of this world almost between the gift cards and the food and the drinks and, yes. and the cash. And it's definitely something that my <laughs> retail store never got. Yeah. Um, Customers love to thank the people that care for their pets. Absolutely. And, and speaking of food, you reminded me of one other, you know, sort of little motivational thing we do. I, I'm also, you know, the weight on my heart is food, so I figure everyone else must be like that too. Um, we, um, every month that we have an incident-free month, and an incident is defined as, you know, maybe someone getting bitten or scratched or another dog having an injury or, or a, you know, a scuffle. Um, every month that we don't have an incident, we have a pizza party. Oh, I like that. That's like back, back to school days. Love it. Yeah. Um, so what happens when a team member just isn't listening or they're just not getting with the program? How do you handle that scenario? Well, depending on the level of how they're not listening, if it's something pretty important, they get a talking to from me personally. And if they do it again, they're gone. Yeah. I really, there's no tolerance for people not listening. And, um, specifically if, if they're not, you know, truthful, I'm very clear with people as well, even if it's about something silly, they will lose their job immediately because I have to be able to trust everybody. Um, but not listening falls kind of on that spectrum and one talk for me and then cut ties. Yeah, I mean, you're so, you're so strong. I can tell it even in the, the, this conversation, <laughs> like, you're strong, you're disciplined, you have, you know, it's either, you know, you, you know, you're, principles and your outlines of how, what you want for your company and you stick to those guidelines. Yeah. Um, so many people struggle with that. I think they, they really feel almost held hostage by their employees. Did that come naturally for you or is it something that you've worked on? Oh if, yeah, I've worked on it. I felt certainly when I first took over, definitely felt hostage to my employees. This is a, a new feeling that I've had in the past maybe year and a half with, you know, being able to actually really change the culture. But in order to change the culture, you do need to be willing to, to stand up and, and not tolerate things. You don't have to not tolerate everything right away, but you need to prioritize and say, okay, this is, you know, for this year, this is what we're focused on. You know, the following year, this is what we're focused on. So little by little, um, we managed to, to weed out some of those behaviors, and now I yeah, have no tolerance for them. Yeah. So one thing that I think has come up every now and again, too, in my, my, even my personal experience, but with clients of ours, is that when an employee goes to social media and complains about either being unhappy with work or they complain about a coworker, has that ever happened to you? How do you handle it? No, and I will tell you why it's never happened. Okay. Before we interview people, we check them online. We check all their Facebook. We check, you know, we do, we Google search them. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite interview stories is that we were able to see before this particular woman was coming for her interview that morning, she uh, referenced that she had uh, smoked some pot. You know, she needs to relax before her interview. So when she came in, I was like, you know what? We're not going to talk because you posted that you're high. So I don't want employees that come to interviews high. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so one way of preventing that is by, you know, we, we look at people's judgment in that way and see if, if they have a lot of 
inappropriate Facebook posts, they're not going to get to the interview phase. But also, um, I imagine later we may talk about onboarding a little bit. As part of our cultural orientation, we talk about this, we have a policy about this. Our policy is that if you have something negative to say, you do not say it on social media. If you do, you will lose your job. Mm -hmm. um, if you have something positive to say, you're welcome to do so. That's great. So it's a written policy. We talk about it. We go over it. And I make sure that people know if they're having a problem here, there are a whole list of people, including myself, that they can come to before turning to social media. I think that people often turn to social media out of frustration if they can't get listened to in some other way. Yes, you're so right. I mean, I, I do. I feel like the situations where we hear that an employee is gossiping in some way, they either don't feel comfortable approaching the person who can actually make change for them or they've tried before and nothing's happened, you know, right. and then now frustrated. Yeah. You know, actually that whole scenario would make a great option as for the real deal at the end Pets plus magazine at the back, they always have these things called the real deal. And it's a scenario that they propose and then they let readers chime in I think that'd be part of their brain squad. Um, if you're if you're a member, anyone can join and you can give your feedback, and then you might get featured in the magazine too. So if anyone from Pets Plus is watching, I think that that would make a a great a great real deal segment. <laughs> um, so now, yeah, I know I know this to be true for so many people that when it comes to hiring a new employee, it's usually because someone has left very quickly or were probably short staffed. Mm -hmm. So um, we typically have people jump in to a shift with like bare bones training because we need, just need to fill the spot so quickly. And we need them to be able to work independently right away. However, that rarely turns out well and the lack of what's called like an onboarding um, or designated training period for a new hire can be really detrimental to a business if you don't have one. So I can imagine that you have a pretty extensive onboarding training process. I would love for you to share some insider secrets <laughs> from your <laughs> to come back to Wall Street insider mm -hmm. secrets um, of what kind of program your onboarding looks like at Camp Canine. Sure. Well, actually, the 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 solution to the the problem you presented actually comes chronologically chronologically even before onboarding. So first of all, staffing. You should never one should never have just enough staff. Um, I've learned that it, it is worth the extra money to have an extra person or two on staff so that you're prepared for when somebody leaves um, and somebody is already trained and ready to go. Um, especially, you know, you could have some extra part-time people if you don't want to pay for an extra full-time person. But, you know, in fact, I was just speaking with um, some folks today where we have a lot more clients and, and a lot more foster dogs and, you know, I may want to bring someone on. Nobody's leaving, nothing's happening, but I see our demand is going up. So I would say it's important not to be reactive, but proactive in your recruiting mm -hmm. and um, generally always be recruiting and make sure you're not in a position where you have just enough people that if you lose someone or if someone's on vacation, a shift goes uncovered. So that mm -hmm. said, you have employees who can fill in and you don't, you're not in a position where someone has to jump in like that. However, yeah. when people do join us, yes, their designated training period is a minimum of three weeks. Wow. They are not, we don't, we call it, we don't count them as a person, which sounds really horrible, actually, now that I say that out loud. <laughs> um, we treat them as a trainee. They're not, you know, we have a certain number of people we need to run our business every day, and we don't count a trainee in that count. That's extra. Wow. They're an extra person for those three weeks. Um, in the beginning of when they start, they go through two different orientations. They go through, you know, the, the tax forms and our, our health care benefits and all that with our manager first. Mm -hmm. And separately, usually after a week or so, I will sit down with them myself and do a cultural orientation. This is something I do take from, from the Wall Street days and the firm I was at. Uh, someone senior in the organization would always talk about the culture as part of orientation. So I do that. I sit down with people um, for about an hour, go over things that are important to me, including the high expectations, among other things, um, and uh, you know, just answer questions as well so they can get a flavor for how I am. And as you mentioned earlier, how to be the kind of voice that I want them to be. Mm -hmm. Aside from those two orientations, they also have that three-week training period. So they're assigned to one of our supervisors who actually has a training program. It's, again, three weeks long, and it's structured. You know, in the beginning, they start out with small dogs staying in the room, learning cleaning procedures. Um, soon thereafter, they'll learn our process for doing walks. Shortly thereafter, 
they will maybe join the bigger dogs, then they'll learn how to do um, a couple of other things. You know, we sort of, we layer it on so people don't get hit with everything all at once. Um, we sort of focus on one thing at a time. How did you build that program? What was the process like to, to just get to tackle that? Because I'm sure that can be overwhelming. Yes, it was overwhelming. And, it, and it, <laughs> that doesn't get built overnight or even in six months. It's taken us a good, I'm going to say two years, to really get that to be where I want it. But just like with the other things in the business, we, we pick something we're going to focus on that year. Like, we're going to get this thing done this year. Um, if you try to do everything at once, I know for me, I get overwhelmed and I get absolutely nothing done. So, you know, we definitely did not, there was an absolutely no onboarding process when I took over the business and I didn't, you know, we're now five and a half years in and we have this. It, it's building blocks one step at a time. Definitely. Well, I, I'm glad we did talk about scheduling a little bit because I've heard a lot from our community at Pet Bus Nation that some people have issues with the whole scheduling and coverage. And you've already touched about how you approach it, that you like to have an extra person there. Um, one comment that was made in the thread, uh, Linda mentioned, she says, if you cut ties, and that goes back to when you've had to let people go. When you cut ties, that equals a short staff for smaller businesses. And so to your point, though, um, if you have the extra team available and trained, or if you have these high expectations and you have all that feedback, you know, if you have to cut somebody, you're not completely strapped. Exactly. Um, but what do you, you know, what's your take on if you, if cash flow is tight, sometimes you have to cut, if your expenses are too high, the easiest place to cut is your payroll. Have you had to go through any of those struggles? Thankfully, no. Okay. Um, that, to me, the payroll is the most important expense that we have. Right? When we're caring for, for dogs and people's babies, and, and we do care for cats now, too. Um, there is nothing more important than having a properly trained and a, a, an appropriate number of staff. I will cut all other things before I cut staff. Um, and, and yes, understood about, about cash flow. Um, you know, I, I imagine in the beginning, you know, I would personally jump in and do things when cash was a little bit tighter. Um, but I think that having a better business and a more successful business will go hand in hand with better customer service, with less turnover of employees. Uh, you know, I think that if you invest in that staff, that you will not have that cash flow problem that you have to manage, you know, one part-time employee out. Yeah, yeah, so it's great advice. So we're going to get to our Q&A very shortly. So if anyone has questions about anything we've talked about, please put them in the chat thread and we'll reference them in a little bit. But first, you know, in your article, you said that you believe that you do well by doing good. So yes. where does that originate in your life? Tell us the background story of that. So, yeah, um, you know, I'm very specifically not a religious person. That's not my thing. You know, if it's your thing, that's terrific. But for me, my religion is um, being a good person and being able to sleep at night and doing the right thing. That is, that is actually like how I aspire to live my life. And um, having your own business, you're much more free to do that than if you're in a corporate environment and, you know, at someone else's mercy. Mm -hmm. You know, I can decide to rescue dogs as much as I want to with this business. Um, you know, I just it's just how I sleep at night. Um, that's the person I want to be. It's turned out to actually be, as I mentioned in the, in the MBR piece, uh, to be actually a good business thing, um, which reinforces my belief that if you do good, you know, good things are going to come back to you. So it's it's just it's inherent. It wasn't an aha moment for me. It's just it's just how I how I need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the whole concept of givers get right. When you give, you get back. Plus, uh, I just love you know I love dogs, and so giving to that cause, it, it's not even like a question. You know, if I'm able to do it, I, I mean, it's not even an option. I'm doing it. Right. Your, uh, well, I think this must be one of your customers is put in the chat thread. Uh, Pam, I'm going to probably mess up her last name, but it's Petra Festa. Uh, yeah, yeah, not a client, but uh, yeah. Okay. Says that the daily photos of the pups and kitties, too, are truly phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Every day. Um, I'd love to comment on that for a moment, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, I had mentioned earlier that there are two staff members that have been here from the beginning. The guy who does our photographer is one such person or who does our photography. 
-hmm. So he's been, you know, he's been a counselor here for over 15 years. Um, so well before I took over. Um, and once I took over, I learned that he had a hobby of photography. So um, we asked him to bring in his camera. He had a fancy camera um, and just start taking pictures of the dogs that we could post on Facebook. And that's um, turned into a competitive advantage for us. And it's fun. And this guy, it, it gives him um, much more motivation to be here. And he gets to, um, you know, do his job and be with the dogs. But also he gets to pursue his passion while he's here photography. And a lot of people do comment on the photos and actually know him because he takes great photos. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Allison, one of your team members is watching and she says that she's so lucky to work for Tanya at Camp Canine. So. Thanks, Allison. We'll get you that gift card right away. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, okay, so we do have a question from Judy. Let me just read it here really quick. Um, I think we're talking, it's talking about payroll um, percentages of your, you know, your percentage of pit that payroll should be. So she just says that the question was recently raised in our um, pet boss group. You know, we've got a network of pet professionals in there um, that they had a 67% payroll cost to gross. So may we ask what your percentage is to gross sales? Sure. It is not that high. Um, when I, when I started out, I was pretty obsessed with what that percentage ought to be. Um, my uh, manager can attest to that. I was very focused. Should it be 45%, 55, 50? And what I've learned is not to focus on that, but to focus on the service and what you need to provide that service. Uh, you know, that said, I do think 67% is quite high. Um, you know, but you, you have to, that's not what I would focus on. I would not focus on that percentage. I would focus on what clients need, what you do to deliver, what you need to do in order to deliver that need. Um, and if, you know, that is coming out to more money than you can make, you may not be charging enough. You might be spending on, you know, maybe you're paying people too much. Maybe you're not staffed efficiently. So that number, bottom line, does sound high to me. But I really urge people not to focus on that number. I don't think it's productive. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, even to the point of this, it's like, you know, you only have, let's say, we take the 100% of your of your revenue that you bring in. And if you have products, there's going to be a certain amount that comes out for that. Your rent is a set price. You're going right. to have some fixed expenses that you cannot change. Yes. But payroll, to your point earlier where you said you invest in your people, but you train them and invest in them. If you have good salespeople or if you've got people who are going to promote your business, you don't have to spend as much on marketing because they're going to be able to close people and they want to help talk about the business out in public and bring sales in. Yes. So, um, you know, it's all a balance. It's all a balance of, but you cannot be spending too much on any of those things if you're not, you know, if you're going over that 100%, right? That's, That's where you're losing money, so. Yes. Um, okay, so Lisa Brisson has a question. She wants to know if you pay attention to your competitors' prices and their rates. I pay very close attention to that, absolutely. Um, you know, we do secret shopper calls um, to our competitors. And here in New York, you know, in Manhattan, where everything's very squished together, I have a competitor literally one half a block away. It's around the corner for me. And I absolutely check on their prices and their, their tour procedures and everything. They're doing marketing constantly. Um, now, that said, that doesn't mean that I necessarily change what I'm doing because of what they're doing. But I need to know what they're doing. So I do check in on it. Um, you know, it's my, ideally, you know, not ideally, we provide better service, in my opinion, than most, if not all other places in, in our area, in our market. Mm -hmm. I know it's a pretty bold statement, but we worked very hard to get there, and I, I believe we are. So I believe that, therefore, you know, we can, we can set our price. No, not a ridiculous price, but I'm very comfortable being above my competitors at this point because we do a better job. When I first took this business over, uh, the prices were about half that of competitors. So over the years, that's one of the ways we've, we've managed to increase our revenue as well, is to better our service and then be able to charge more. Yeah, and so I love what you just said there where you monitor it, but it doesn't make it doesn't have to influence you. Um, I love that. Kathy, uh, she has a question about what has been your most successful marketing campaign? Ooh, that's a good question, Kathy. Um, hmm. Let me think for a moment about that. I'm not sure I have a single successful marketing campaign. Um, 
it's all ongoing. And maybe campaign you know, means that actually in the context of this question. Um, Google AdWords are very important. It's frustrating and unfortunate, but important. Um, you need to spend a good amount of money um, for Google Ads and making sure your, your SEO on your website is very good and being closely managed. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, I I'm a big fan of guerrilla marketing, and I love using Instagram and Facebook for our marketing. Um, we've managed to develop a, a pretty good following and have gotten clients um, you know, through that as well. So I tend to focus um, like a lot of things, right? Blocks, you know, little bits, um, just doing doing it consistently. So it's not about like a big splashy campaign or anything like that. Yeah, but one of the things that you have like made it looks like based on even the, the photos of your lobby area and the pictures, we didn't talk about that, but all those photos that are on that wall, those are dogs that were rescue dogs that you gave space to in your facility to try to rehome, is that correct? That's right. So that's a lot of um, animals that you've helped over the years, and it's a big yeah. impact you've made, and you were very connected with your community and the rescue world. I mean, I even saw on our Pet Boss Nation Facebook page today that some of your rescue partners were sharing that you were going to be on yeah. here today. So yeah, really I, I love, I mean, I, to see that from my perspective, too, just means that you absolutely are um, somebody who is important to her local community. Mm -hmm. How did you get into developing that because uh, it's it's a marketing campaign so well to give back it's still a campaign true and you're right actually that is has been a tremendous help in terms of our overall success actually that's not the motivation of course for doing it but it has turned out we get a lot of good publicity from it you know and again it goes back to my own code you know you you know do well by doing good mm -hmm. um, but um, Sorry, your question was about how I developed those ties. Was that right? I'm sorry about the. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking about like what made you. Um, I guess when we think about that, it's just it's just you've you've. What actually, what I think it was really great about it is not not you didn't just only you know give some space to these dogs, but you've given you've you're sharing their story and you're sharing what you're doing um, yeah. in, in your lobby. You know, you're you're bring, you're kind of filtering it through a lot of other areas. Right. So how else do you share that that's something you do? Is it part of the conversation on your social media content or is it on your website? Always, okay. always. always. Um, yeah, it's everywhere. Um, certainly in addition to in the lobby posting the, the dogs that have been rehomed, we also have a section of dogs for adoption. And a lot of our clients, you know, they know when we're getting new dogs in because we post on social media. They all like to see the, the new dogs on the social media. People comment. Um, share it with a friend, you know, people get involved. And actually we have a lot of volunteers now that are clients that have gotten involved because of this. So yeah. it generates an overall excitement throughout throughout the entire community. And, and people are just, they're into it. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay, Judy has another question here. She wants to know what your opinion is on Facebook reviews and how you should handle a negative review, even if it's not true. So um, I will extrapolate that and talk not only about Facebook reviews, but also Google and Yelp. Because I, I actually really focus on Google and Yelp. Um, I think that people, I believe people look at those more critically. The same principles apply to all of them. Um, when people leave you a good review, be sure to thank them. Whether it's in person when you see them or send them an email, you know, obviously they're a client. Please, you know, do thank people for all the good stuff they do. When the negative one comes up, the best thing to do is talk to the person, right? Just like the employee who posts on social media because he or she feels they have no other, no other way to be listened to. Most people do that because they feel that they're not list being listened to. Um, unfortunately, you know, the best thing to do is to prevent that from happening in the first place mm -hmm. by being around and dealing with disgruntled customers proactively. But if you can't do that, um, you need to get in touch immediately with whoever leaves that review. Um, if Backing up, if it's completely false, um, you may be able to get removed by Yelp or by Google. I don't know that Facebook removes them. Um, the first step is if it's completely untrue or, or they're not a client, you can petition to have it removed. Generally, that's not going to work, but it's worth a shot. Um, then you reach out to the person and see if you can't turn them. You know, we've had a couple of people who have left poor reviews who are now good clients. So you, you, you offer them something. They can come in, meet with you, and maybe work out something. And once you do work out something, by the way, you, you ask them to take that review down. 
Um, and that, that should definitely be part of the conversation once you feel they're on board. Um, if none of those things happen, I would respond to the review in a very rational way. Um, you know, you can certainly look at Camp Canine. We, we've had some stuff even under my management on, on Yelp. Um, can take a look at some of the responses I posted there where I was unsuccessful in those efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at least you can go back and let people know that you have attempted to make it right and exactly. you know you appreciate their business and if there's anything you can do for them, yep. not hesitate to reach out. Yeah. So Anna Powell is also saying a huge thanks to, thanks <laughs> to Tanya, Camp K9 from Keto, a rescue dog adopted through Tanya who became a camper the next day. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Tito. Hi, Tito. <laughs> <laughs> I love that your customers are watching, too. So yeah. as we wrap this up, um, you, I'd love to ask favorite business resources yep. that uh, our, our experts want to share. And you suggested the Disney U book, which yes. I love because I'm a former Disney University. I did their college program. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, da, 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 I love Disney. So, um, And that book is a great book. Why do you love it so much? It really speaks to the kind of customer service that I think anyone in our industry needs to have. You know, people are trusting you with their with their babies and you need to follow those 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 guidelines and be responsive and, um, you know, exhibit the highest level of customer service and caring. Um, so I, I do give that book to to employees to read and, and use the principles, you know, in our in our everyday in our everyday work. I also have a favorite quote. I'm not sure if you're gonna ask me that or not, but I wanna share it. Um, and this is hanging in my office. Um, it's, it sounds very fancy, it's Aristotle, but it's, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence therefore is not an act, but a habit. I live that and that's the, the high expectation thing. It happens every single day. It's a habit. So and that is, that's what I, that's a guiding thing for me in business. That's true. You know, nothing. We have good habits and we have bad habits, and it's way more important to have good habits and to eliminate those bad habits. So that's a very, very good point. Well, Ty, I just want to say thank you so much for um, joining us tonight. Your insight and your just willingness to be open and to share about your business is so greatly appreciated. Um, it means a lot. I mean, the chat, the chat's very full of people who are just saying thank you, and this has been a great interview. So awesome. really thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your, your publication is wonderful. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Pets plus. I just love that magazine. And when I, when I read the first issue, I reached out to the editor and I was like, I've got to be involved somehow. This, I just love this magazine so much. So, um, well, thank you, Tanya. Uh, maybe we'll see you again on another pets plus webinar. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank now, you. For everyone else that is still with us, I just want to thank you for joining me tonight on this Pets Plus Live Beyond the Pages. I know that your time is extremely valuable, so I'm truly honored that you've joined us. My name is Candace Daniolo, your show host. I deeply believe that we are stronger together. So please invite your fellow pet business owners to join us on future episodes or if you're available, you can join us in our Pet Boss Nation Facebook group. It's a community that's completely free and available to anyone in the pet industry. Just look up Pet Boss Nation uh, group. And make sure that you're getting the latest issue of Pets Plus Magazine. You can get it and a lot of other great content by visiting their website, petsplusmag.com. All right, everyone, we'll have a wonderful night. And remember to lead the pack. Pet bosses. Have a great evening. <laughs>